Welcome, ladies and gents. Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter, or of course, you can subscribe to the channel, Let's Talk Boxing. We're going to cover a very emotive and very controversial subject. Before you guys leave a comment down below to agree or disagree, before you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, I will implore you, please, hear this video out till the end. Hear it to its conclusion. It might be a little bit long, put it on in the background while you're driving, while you're going for a jog, while you're doing your house chores, whatever it is you might do. But please, before you share your opinion, I may change your opinion on something. Hear the video out to the end, or it might solidify your position in agreeing with me or disagreeing with me, and then it's totally fine, of course, to leave your comment below. But please, hear me out. The topic I want to talk about is Terence Crawford against Bob Arum, this court case that has arisen. Terence Crawford is reportedly taking him to court for, and I quote, revolting racial bias, which has apparently prevented him, allegedly prevented him, from securing big money fights and earning millions. And it's reported that he's suing for damages expected to be up to $10 million. This is according to Michael Benson, as was originally um, reported by the New York Post. Now, the reason that this is such as an emotive subject is because it deals with concepts of, of race and race relations. And, you know, it's a loaded topic. I was having a conversation with Hatman yesterday on his Discord uh, about nothing related to this specific thing. But we were talking, Hatman and I sometimes were awake at silly hours when everybody else seems to be uh, asleep. Clearly a, a fellow insomniac and we can get into some really deep conversations in the early hours of the morning. Last night we were discussing various socio-economic and socio-political um, topics. And although that's not directly related to this, and I love my conversations with Hatman, some of it does translate over because this topic isn't just dealing with sport. It's not just dealing with one athlete and one promotional company. This raises other wider questions of race relations and civil rights and things like that. Okay, so it's obviously a very emotive subject. Now, one of the things that I've noticed about the United States, and I've never been to the US, this is a mere observational uh, experience through social media. So I have to put that caveat out there. But America seems very polarized to the point whereby you will have a lot of people that will form an opinion prior to observing any evidence. You instantly, and they instantly know which side they will take prior to any evidence being presented. So God forbid, right, tomorrow, God forbid, we were to hear about a guy who was shot by a police officer. This particular guy was from one demographic, the police officer was from another demographic. You will have one group of people, regardless of the evidence on display, that will instantly support the police officer. They will instantly say this guy acted in good faith. He had no choice but to pull the trigger. You will have the opposing group of people who, again, regardless of the evidence, will assume that a murder took place, that this was racially motivated and so on and so forth. And the reason that this happens, in my humble opinion, is because there is so much history and emotional baggage loaded onto this question that people pledge allegiance, if you like, to the wider ideological question. They believe that in order to find justice, the wider ideological question has to prevail. What I would suggest is that for justice to be found, you have to actually micro-analyze every small individual case. Each case has its own identity. In other words, you're going to have some cases where a police officer did have to act in the way he acted, and you're going to have other cases where there was no explanation for the way he acted, and what occurred was abhorrent, right? And in my humble opinion, that's what you need to focus on, rather than allowing your wider ideological position to take hold. And I want you to bear that in mind when we're discussing this topic here. Now, one of the things we have to start off and say, I just want to quickly dismiss a couple of things that have been sort of thrown out there on social media already, because they're not relevant. So I've seen a lot of people say, I can't believe Terence Crawford is saying that Bob Arum is a white supremacist. Or how can you call Bob Arum a white supremacist? Now, Bob Arum is Jewish, and if you were to look at various studies or various uh, polls of self-identification, censuses and stuff like that, the majority of Jews do not consider themselves to be whites. They do not identify as white. They identify as a, a unique individual group of people, a race of their own, a Semitic people. If you were to go onto Wikipedia, for instance, and look up Semitic people, you will see it says, Semite Semitic peoples or Semitic cultures was a term for an ethnic, cultural or racial group. This biblical terminology for race was derived from Shem, one of the three sons of Noah in the book of Genesis. In archaeology, the term is sometimes used informally as a kind of shorthand for ancient Semitic speaking peoples. This is where you also get the modern day phrase anti-Semitic. So, yes, when people are questioning, it's ridiculous, how can you call Bob Arum a white supremacist? 
yeah, he's unlikely to identify as white. So he's certainly not likely to identify as a white supremacist. However, that does not exonerate him. Anybody from any racial group can be prejudiced against another person from another racial group, right? So the accusation here is not that he is a white supremacist. The lawsuit is that he is prejudiced against black fighters. And this is an important point to, to emphasize because a lot of people are instantly dismissing what's being said here by saying, how can you call Bob Arum a white supremacist? That's just one thing I wanted to point out. But it does not exonerate him from what Crawford is accusing him of. The second thing is that a lot of people are saying, well, if Terence Crawford was telling the truth, why would he have re-signed with Bob Arum in 2018? Now, this is an important topic of debate. However, this also does not prove that the accusations are false because how do you know what has occurred since 2018? Has something been said? Has there been some sort of email trail? Has somebody been recorded saying something? We don't know. These things will reveal themselves in a court case. But the point is, up until 2018, I guess you could reliably come to the conclusion that Terence Crawford did not believe the accusations that are being made by his lawsuit, by his legal team. But since then, we don't know what has occurred. Now, let's look at this particular set of uh, comments from the lawsuit and why I believe his law team have potentially dropped the ball here. Now, dropping the ball could mean that he does not win the court case. That doesn't mean, again, it doesn't mean that he's lying. It's just a question of what you can prove, right? Like the, the phrase goes in training day. It's not about what you know, it's what you can prove. And that is what applies in a court case. A quote from Terence Crawford's lawsuit, and that is top rank, a company with zero black executives and only two or three black employees, refuses to admit that it does not care about, support, or know how to promote black fighters. I want to repeat that last bit. It refuses to admit that it does not care about, number one, support, number two, or know how to promote black fighters, number three. Now, one of the reasons I believe that they've dropped the ball is because a third point here of not knowing how to promote black fighters could be used to undermine their first two points, that they, number one, do not care about black fighters, and number two, do not support black fighters. There's a contradiction between those two and the third, and I'll explain what I mean via an analogy. I want you to imagine that I'm a newly qualified chef, and I've decided I'm going to dive into my first foray in the culinary world with an international restaurant, a restaurant that deals with international cuisine. And I'm going to be giving dishes from all over the world to my customers. And my first three sets of customers are couples. One of them is a white couple from Poland. Another one is a white couple from France. And the other one is a black couple from Jamaica. And they all sit down and they all decide they want to taste the dishes from their homelands. It's been a while since they've been back home. They want a taste of back home. They want to reminisce. So they're all going to order a dish that is rather traditional in their own cuisines. Now... The Polish couple want to order bigosh, traditional Polish dish. The French couple are going to order boeuf bourguignon. And the Jamaican couple are going to order jerk chicken. Each of the couples turns and says, can I replace one of the items on the menu, the side dish? Rather than having dauphinois potatoes, can I have mashed potatoes? Rather than having rice, can I have couscous and so on and so forth? Now, if I'm going to be fair, I would apply the same rule to all of them. So, yeah, sure, no problem, sir. No problem, madam. Anything to keep you happy, no problem. If that's what you want, I will serve it to you. Now, if I do not care about one couple, I might say, yeah, listen, to the Polish couple, I'll replace your side dish. Don't worry about that particular thing. I'll bring you this. To the French couple too, no problem, sir, madam. I will bring you whatever side dish you want. To the Jamaican couple, who I don't care about, oh, I don't want to go for the extra effort. No, listen, this is how it comes on the menu. Do you want the dish or not? That could lead to the accusation of me not caring about them. Then comes the question of support. Let's say that that first thing never happened. And instead of them asking for a different side dish, they each told me, I have a series of allergies. Could we go through the menu, please? If I tell you my allergies, could we go through the menu and you tell me what dish I can and can't have? So I turn to the Polish couple and I say, no problem, sir. Let me just bring the ingredients menu. I'll tell you everything and every little thing. We want you to be safe. And your experience here is of our utmost concern. I say the same thing to the French couple. With a Jamaican couple, oh, listen, man, I, I don't know. You're, you're telling me you're allergic to soya. They might use soy sauce in this. I don't know. They definitely don't use it in that dish there. So why don't you go for that dish instead? That's a lack of support. I can't be bothered to sit there going through the whole menu. I'm not supporting you. This dish, I know there's no allergens there. Don't worry about it. Just order that. Lack of caring. However, 
not knowing how to promote black fighters. That's a third point. Let's say I say to all three couples, no problem. I will ensure, I will clean the surfaces. I will ensure that that particular allergen does not exist anywhere near the dish that I'm going to provide for you. And yes, I will change your side dish. Let me know if there's anything else you need. And I bring the three dishes to each couple. And the Polish couple say, wow, man, this is the best bigosh I've had outside of Warsaw. The French couple tell me, wow, this birth bourguignon, it makes me feel like I'm in the cobbled streets of Paris. The Jamaican couple turn and say, this jerk chicken's under seasoned. It's bland. It's not very nice. I did my utmost to provide them with the best possible dish. Just because I am incapable of cooking a great jerk chicken, i.e. the equivalent of not knowing how to promote black fighters. Because the quote here from Terence Crawford's lawsuit seems to suggest that promoting black fighters is different to promoting other types of fighters, right? It's in the nature of the accusation. You don't know how to promote black fighters. In other words, it requires a specific skill or a specific set of knowledge, which you do not possess. Me not knowing how to cook this perfect jerk chicken has nothing to do with me not caring about my customers. It has nothing to do with me not showing them support. It is merely displaying that I'm inept when it comes to trying to cook Caribbean cuisine. Well, this has always been my position that Bob Arum, who has done a terrible job with Terence Crawford, has been incapable of creating a superstar out of a man that has the talent to be a superstar. And when a promoter would always say, well, listen, he doesn't give interviews. He's got to show his personality. Why isn't he involved in more trash talking? He's not helping himself. You are a promoter. You are signed to promote. If he's going to do his own promotional work, he might as well not need you. He might go, might as well go it alone, just like Floyd did and became a superstar. Just like David Hay did and became a superstar, a pay-per-view star, right? Are you able to promote me or are you telling me that I have to promote myself? Are you capable of doing this job or not? That inability, and bear in mind, I do not like Bob Arum, okay? I do not like Bob Arum, but that inability does not equate to prejudice necessarily. Now, this does not, again, exonerate Bob Arum because there may be an example of them not knowing how to promote black fighters and they wouldn't care to learn because they don't care about supporting him and they don't want to push him forward and they don't want to help him. They couldn't care less about him. This is also problematic. Because you then have to prove that Bob Arum's racial bias supersedes his willingness and his drive to make money. Because Terence Crawford is the asset that belongs to top rank. The better he does, the better top rank does financially. So it is in their best interest financially and professionally in this war of promoters where they're seeking to get supremacy over each other for Terence Crawford to become a superstar. If you are arguing that he does not know how to prom promote black fighters and he doesn't want to support them and he doesn't care about them and that supersedes the importance of Crawford being a success, well, then what you're saying is that he is so racist against black fighters that he would rather take an L financially and professionally than make Terence Crawford into a superstar. That's going to be incredibly hard to prove especially because Bob Arum has a history with promoting some great black fighters. He promoted Muhammad Ali, right? Now, again, I am not saying Bob Arum is innocent and I'm not saying he's guilty either. Due process has to take place. We do not know what evidence Terence Crawford's legal team is going to present. I'm gonna give you a little word of advice, right? And these last couple of years should have woken people up to this, to be honest with you. But just in case it hasn't and the penny still hasn't dropped. If you want to be a critical thinker and you want to achieve truth or reach the truth in any walk of life, the one word of advice I would give you is never to instantly dismiss anything that immediately strikes you as odd or untrue. Hear the evidence first. Hear what the guy's got to say. Analyze that evidence. Analyze the opposing evidence. And then reach your conclusion. Too many people will instantly trust authority or trust whatever prevailing narrative exists in their head and they will instantly dismiss anything that goes against that prevailing narrative. Don't do that. You're only fooling yourself and you will never ever reach truth. You're just in this perpetual cycle of an echo chamber that you have applied to yourself, to your own mind. And so I want to hear what Crawford's legal team have to say before I instantly dismiss it. But my initial thoughts are, He's going to find it very, very difficult to prove 
that any such thing is occurring, which leads me to speculate about something else. And I'm not making this accusation aimed at Terence Crawford, but I'm just going to ask the question. I'm going to pose it and ask you guys, what do you guys think of this? Now, in the US, this polarization that I spoke about earlier does manifest itself in boxing to, to some degree, based again on my observational experience. I've never been to the US. But in the US, the concept of race seems to be at the forefront of a lot more things than it does here in the UK, for instance. So you will see a lot of fight fans, and again, this is just observational experience, that will affiliate with a particular promotional company based on things like race. You know, you'll see a lot of Hispanic Americans that will support Golden Boy and Oscar de la Hoya. You'll see a lot of uh, African Americans that will support the PBC and Al Heyman. Now, that's not to say that that's everybody, of course, some of the best critical thinkers who will judge, you know, each individual fighter on their own merit and stuff like that will be from all walks of life, okay, and all backgrounds. I'm not saying this applies to everybody, of course not. But some patterns do exist there. Uh, the LDBC, for example, will often openly talk about how they will ride with their guys and they will support their guys. And they speak about this openly. This is not something that's hidden, right? Well, when it came to Crawford versus Errol Spence, the majority of the people that would identify as the LDBC were backing Errol Spence. He was seen as representing the people of the PBC. This is how they saw it. The father of Devin Haney himself has said that Tank Davis and Devin Haney actually share a demographic of fans. This is his quote, not mine, right? So clearly this is something that fighters take into account when they're trying to build the fan base. Deontay Wilder has said something and he's trying to achieve a certain loyalty from a certain group. Well, in the UK, we don't really have that as much here, right? In my lifetime, the most popular fighters I've come across in Britain were Frank Bruno, um, uh, Anthony Joshua, Ricky Hatton, Nigel Benn was very popular, but I think the first three were the most popular and two of them are black, one of them was white. Is this a play to get some of them on side? Is this a play to say, listen, I'm moving to the PBC because I need to make this Errol Spence fight happen? I don't want to walk into a lion's den. I don't want to walk into the PBC as an outsider. I want to be accepted equally as a fighter in the same way that Errol Spence is so that I get a fair shake, so that Al Heyman sees my loyalty now lies with him, so that there's no dodgy judging going on. Is this 3D chess, so to speak? Is he laying the groundwork? Is that what this is about? That's just speculation. It could be nothing to do with any of that. This could be a genuine lawsuit and we're going to see some very compelling evidence. Who knows? Let me know what you think about everything. I do thank you for listening to the end. Let me know what your position is on this. In summary, I have no idea whether Bob Arum has done or said anything that justifies these claims yet because I have not seen the evidence yet. But on what is readily available, based on what the legal team of Terence Crawford have said and what Terence Crawford's position has been and his actions, I think it's going to be very difficult to prove this. Thanks for watching, everyone. Let me know what your opinion is. Take care and God bless.